Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. This is uh, event handling at scale, designing an auditable ingestion and persistence architecture for 10,000 plus events per second. Possibly the longest session title that you're here this year. My name is Benjamin Felden. Uh, I am a solutions architect with Amazon Web Services. And with me here today is Terry Sage, Vice President of Engineering at McGraw-Hill Education. So I'd like to start today's talk by uh, kind of framing the conversation a little bit. Um, as a solutions architect, one of the customers that I've had a privilege of working with is McGraw-Hill Education. And I began uh, working with their different teams about two years ago. And it was back then when we first began discussing their learning analytics platform. And throughout this period of time, that platform has evolved through a number of iterations and has grown to be ultimately a true believer in the serverless computing approach. And so we wanted to invite Terry to come and speak to us today about how this platform has evolved and how they've managed to scale it and some of the things that they have learned along the way. So with that, I will hand it over to Terry. Thank you, Benjamin. So what to expect from this session? I'm going to go over the business background in terms of why we built this platform, how it fits into the overall learning ecosystem, talk about learning events and what they mean and how we're using JSON for the learning events, talk about the overall architecture and the different Amazon services that we use to build it out, talk about, too, some of the trade-offs. So for example, why we selected Lambda versus many EC2 instances. And then go over the challenges that we encountered, such as we lost events, how we built confidence despite losing those events, and then some of the lessons learned. So McGraw-Hill Education is a 128-year-old publishing company? No, we've changed. We've actually transformed quite a bit into a, uh, from this traditional publishing company into a digital learning company. So what does that mean? The basis for this is learning analytics. So what we do is we have what's called a learning management system. That learning management system is basically where the students log in, they look at their homework assignments, they may read a book online, and then they submit the homework assignment. That causes an event to be sent then from that system to the analytics platform. So uh, basically, the very first incarnation of this needs to support about 2 million students and then to scale to 14 million students with an initial load of 10,000 events per second. And in the future, we need to handle about 15 million events per second. And the reason for this is we're adding on, obviously, more applications, more things such as mobile devices, as well as video. In terms of the cyclical nature of our business, and what's really super important for us, is the ability to scale up and scale down. Um, you probably are very familiar with what happens from about the August to December time frame, and then from January to May, we have to be able to sustain the loads, um, particularly like for a college student where we see a lot of traffic Sunday through Monday. And this is because generally, uh, uh, college students like to submit their homework assignments late. I did. Um, and then in terms of the service level agreements, and also to um, what we had to think about, not only just the ingestion of the events, but what would it take to provide the visualizations and the reports. So it's about sustaining a load of output of about 300 events output per second. And then also, too, to handle what we call the batch load of learning events into the system. Uh, another um, sort of point here to make is that our business is very cost conscientious. So we have to be able to create systems with a very low price point per student. And then we have what are called just-in-time insights. It's about the learning moment. So it's about uh, providing almost in real time uh, either reports or some sort of an analysis, or even like an adaptive engine based on these learning events. I'm going to provide some examples of Connect Insights, the visualizations that are actually powered by these learning events. 
So then um, uh, this is the very first report. This is that what we call an at-risk report, which provides instructors with one-click access to a dashboard to identify students who are at risk of dropping out due to low engagement levels. So we look for patterns, basically, of online activity to determine the, the engagement level of the student, including events such as the frequency of logins and assignment submissions. This is the second report. This is about student performance. So it allows instructors to search for a specific student in the class, in this example, Megan, and focus on Megan's progress across assignments. So they view the assignment that has been submitted, and any, any other assignment the student has in progress. They, have, they may have like an attempt one, attempt two, or an attempt three. And also, too, to be able to provide guidance or feedback uh, during the process of those submissions. This is what we call a student distribution report. It basically gives information at a glance about the section. So this chart lets the instructors review the performance of the entire section and then to drill down. So for example, if you look at the seven on the lower right-hand corner, you'll see that these students have low scores, but they've spent a lot of time working on the assignments. So you're gonna have an instructor ask, why has this happened? So you drill down and you see the section performance for these seven students, which is depicted here, and their scores on the eight assignments. And there's obviously more questions that the instructor will continue to ask and to drill down. This is what we call a connect quick review report that allows instructors to run reports that span multiple sections and students and then drill down on one student. So for example, they've selected one of the students here. This is Nikki Adam. This is the drill down, and the instructor can quickly review the performance of the student. So we talked briefly about learning events. Again, these are the uh, things, if you will, that we send from one system to another system. And we use what's called a caliper standard. So this caliper standard uh, is from IMS Global Consortium and was created in 2013. We do support the 47 different events um, and these are what we call uh, JSON link directory, JSON LD. And then, um, so basically what the platform does is that it then ingests those caliper events. Um, and then there may be many caliper events sent in the one message. We split that apart, parse it, and then we have um, various analytics that are run against that data set. The image depicts the IMS analytics implementation guide, which may be found at the IMS Consortium website. So this is an example of a caliper event. It's JSON-LD, it's a test quiz file, and shown is a scaffolding for one question. The title of the item is given in line seven, that a chopper is a type of question mark. The response variable is defined in lines 12 through 19. The associated correct answer is defined as a motorcycle, which appears in lines 16 through 17. And then for the outcome variables defined for the item in lines 20 through 51, of which we only see lines 20 through about 37 here in this image. So there are two variables, score and max score. These are used to store the user score and the maximum possible scores for this item. So we actually evolved this platform, as Benjamin has mentioned, over several years. This is the very first iteration of the learning analytics platform. And basically, it's uh, LAP 1.0, and it's a cluster of Node.js servers. We were able to ingest a fairly large volume of uh, learner data and then process aggregations, and then write these aggregations to MongoDB, and then to provide the Connect Insight reports. Um, however, after performance testing, we realized this architecture would not scale. And subsequently, we had multiple iterations on this architecture over the span of about two years, resulting in iterations of LAP 1.1 through LAP 1.5. For LAP 1.1, we applied a classic software engineering solution, which is basically to put a queue between the Node.js servers and the database, Amazon SQS, 
But unfortunately, again, we weren't really able to hit that peak low that we committed to, which was the 10,000 events per second. So when we looked at this, we realized we probably needed to decouple the ingestion further from the processing and storage. So for lap 1.2, um, we had some difficulties with MongoDB tuning for conditional inserts and different types of aggregations. The crux of the matter was we really didn't have the institutional knowledge with MongoDB. So processing was modified to basically pre-aggregate events in S3. So thus when a full set of aggregations um, were compiled and they were loaded into MongoDB. This solved basically the MongoDB performance issues but introduced some subtle data loss problems. This is lap 1.3. Basically we have event grouping and pre-aggregation which we migrated over into Amazon DynamoDB. The data consistency problem went away and this resolved really our data loss uh, issues that we were encountering. But we still had some minor bugs in the system. So lap 1.4 and 1.5 were about stability and fixing the bugs that we had. So um, when we started to look at this architecture though, we realized that we had customized it to just be able to deliver those Connect Insight reports. We needed really a more general solution uh, to be able to accept all of the events um, as well as even external applications that would provide events to us. And we also did um, a, an estimate of what it's going to uh, cost for 1 billion events. That was about 430K. So we realized that with the many different types of applications that we have within our portfolio, in concert with um, the overall sort of, um, that we wanted to support um, third party applications, that this really would quickly exceed the national debt at the rate we were going. So hence the reason that we really need to think about the architecture to re-architect it as a cost-effective, highly scalable, and reliable architecture. So if you fast forward, this is Learning Analytics Platform 2016. We've completely re-architected and implemented a robust solution, which has integrated many of the Amazon components, including uh, AWS API Gateway, Lambda, Kinesis Streams, Simple Storage Services, and Elasticsearch Services, DynamoDB, and RDS Postgres SQL. The architecture is composed of the following four main elements, input, output, reconcile, and stream processing layer. The input API is basically the interface for the events and other domain events for the learning analytics platform. Domain events will be basically a superset of caliper events. They are intended to capture information that may not be contained within the caliper specification. The reconcile API basically maintains the audit trail and it's used to playback events. Then the output API is used for supporting queries to build the reports like the connect insight reports. Then we have what's this stream processing layer, and this is actually uh, the most important element because this is where we aggregate process and store events to a storage mechanism as well as provide additional analytics. This too is where we run a lot of our research algorithms on the event data. So for example, we may have like a cheating detection algorithm. So we, before we dive further into each layer of the architecture, Benjamin is going to give us an overview of the Amazon services used. Thank you, Terry. So um, I wanted to provide an overview of some of the services that feature in the learning analytics platform. Um, but the idea here is not to do a deep dive into any of them. This is more rather an intro uh, for the benefit of those of us who perhaps haven't had a chance yet to, to work with them. Uh, some of them, like S3 and RDS and DynamoDB, have been around for a while longer. And so I'll move through them at a quicker pace. I'd like to start with Amazon API Gateway. Uh, API Gateway is a fully managed service that is, makes it easy for developers to create, publish, maintain, monitor, and secure APIs at any scale. 
API Gateway lets you switch between or combine multiple backends. Um, and it, similarly, it allows you to you work using multiple versions of the same API, so that lets you uh, test and release and iterate through multiple versions. API Gateway provides uh, network protection, and that's something that we do very well because it requires hyperscale. So while you may not be able to auto-scale your application to mitigate an attack, API Gateway can, and it will provide that layer of protection. Another functionality is that it allows you to authenticate access into your APIs um, using some identity tools that AWS has in its platform, like IAM, Identity and Access Management, and Amazon Cognito. So API Gateway will authorize access to your APIs using those tools. If you've ever worked against any um, AWS service API, you may be familiar with SIGv4. SIGv4 is an authentication algorithm that lets you sign API calls with authentication information. So with API Gateway, um, we've essentially extended our identity service so that you now can authorize access to your API using SIGv4. Another common use case is um, making your API into a business where you can provide third-party developers with authentication information and then um, throttle, meter, or cap their usage on a daily basis. This depicts how API Gateway fits into the ecosystem. What happens is a CloudFront distribution is created for every API. You won't see that CloudFront distribution in your account, and you won't be charged for it. And then clients will hit your API through the CloudFront distribution through its network of edge locations. API Gateway can be set to cache responses. Um, but when it does need to hit the backend API, that can be a Lambda function. It can be an HTTP endpoint running on EC2 or anything else that is publicly accessible. With CloudWatch, you can get metrics about your API usage, including down to the individual method level. The next service I'd like to talk about is Lambda. Uh, AWS Lambda is a service that allows you to run code without provisioning or managing servers at all. With Lambda, you only pay for the compute cycles that you consume, and you consume them in 100 millisecond increments. There is no charge for when your code is not running. Lambda can support virtually any type of application or backend service or with zero administration. And Lambda's truly at the heart of serverless computing. It will completely abstract away all of the underlying infrastructure. Lambda will automatically scale your application by running code in response to each trigger. So from your perspective, it is the same level of effort that is associated with running your function once, or once every hour, or thousands of times per second. Lambda currently supports code written in Node.js, Python, and Java. You simply upload your code, specify how you wish to invoke it, and your code can include existing libraries and even native ones. So this concept of being event-driven, that event can be uh, an object landing in S3, or a DynamoDB update, an API gateway call, or even a scheduled job uh, similar to a cron job. Lambda will then execute your code and provide you insight into your metrics and logs uh, through CloudWatch. When that code is executing, it actually access other AWS services, whether inside or outside of your VPC. So one example that we, we sometimes use to kind of demonstrate how all of this ties together is to imagine a workflow where an image lands into S3 and that triggers a Lambda function that creates a thumbnail of that image and that gets stored back into S3. And if you wanted to, the thumbnail being stored in S3 could be a trigger for a separate Lambda function. And so it's easy to imagine how with these isolated functions and these events, you can create either very simple or very complex workflows. The next service I'll talk about is Kinesis Streams. Uh, Kinesis Streams allows you to build custom applications that process or analyze streaming data in near real time. Uh, Kinesis Streams will continuously capture and store up to terabytes of data per hour from hundreds of thousands of sources, so things like website click streams, financial transactions, social media feeds, or in the example that we're talking about today, learning events. Some customers think about Kinesis Streams as Amazon's fully managed alternative to running Apache Kafka on EC2. You may have also heard of 
services called uh, Kinesis Firehose and Kinesis Analytics. Those are beyond the scope of what we'll talk about today, but the takeaway is that Kinesis has evolved into being a true platform for handling real-time streaming data. If we look at how Kinesis Streams will make large-scale data ingest easy, on the one hand, we have data producers, and you will configure your producers to push data into the Kinesis Stream. And then you can have multiple consumers of those data um, that will read and process. You have full control over how the stream is organized, how you partition your data, how you scale your stream, and how you process the data. So if you look at the technologies by which we can send data into the stream, uh, they consist of a variety of technologies, all the way from the AWS SDKs, the Amazon Kinesis producer library, uh, and a variety of open source technologies like Log4j and Flume and FluentD. And then on the other hand, we have a variety of technologies that will consume the data. So all the way up from raw API calls to high level methods like the Kinesis client library or Kinesis analytics or Lambda. The Kinesis client library is an open source one that will make the task of writing your uh, stream processing application much easier. And then finally, we have open source uh, technologies like Apache Storm or Spark that have the native capacity to consume the stream. I'd like to talk about Elasticsearch, but before we get into the Elasticsearch service that we operate, let's talk about it in a little bit of a broader context. Elasticsearch is an open source search engine. Um, it's around since 2009. It's been very successful with over 120 million downloads to date. A traditional search engine will take in documents and then find relevant matches based on textual queries. From very early on, uh, Elasticsearch really specialized to provide ingest and analysis of log files or log lines. So things like Apache web logs or system logs or application logs. And you may have heard of uh, what is commonly referred to as an Elk stack, which uh, combines uh, Elasticsearch and open source Logstash and Kibana. And this trio has become the de facto standard in real-time monitoring and analysis. So one thing that we kept hearing from customers is, we love Elasticsearch, but the task of creating and managing these clusters is we see it as consuming, time-consuming, and undifferentiated. And so enter Amazon Elasticsearch service. So the Elasticsearch service allows you to set up and configure your Elasticsearch cluster in minutes. Uh, the service will provision all of the resources that are needed and will launch them. The service can help you scale by making either an API call or using <clears throat> the console. With the Elasticsearch service, you get access to the Elasticsearch open source API so that any code or existing applications that you have that are already using Elasticsearch will work out of the box. Or in other words, it is a, it's designed as a drop-in replacement for your existing Elasticsearch cluster. The service will detect and replace failed Elasticsearch nodes, and that reduces the overhead that is associated with managing them. If you turn on zone awareness, uh, it will provide high availability by spreading uh, node members across two availability zones. And with built-in features like uh, taking snapshots, your data is highly durable as well. And also, we provide security for the cluster down to the index level, and it will integrate with IAM for policy, uh, monitoring with CloudWatch, and auditing with CloudTrail. So one of the greatest benefits of the Elasticsearch service is its native integrations for ingests with AWS services. So things like CloudWatch logs, or Kinesis Firehose, or CloudFormation. You can also ingest data using Lambda, and that will connect you to things like S3 and DynamoDB. And you can also connect Logstash to an Elasticsearch cluster. So here you can see um, a data flow diagram that depicts some of the ways that um, Elasticsearch service can integrate with other services. So I imagine that at this point, S3 requires little introduction, but just as a very quick uh, refresher, S3, Simple Storage Service, provides uh, developers and IT teams with secure, durable, highly scalable cloud storage. S3 is very easy to use, object storage, with a simple web interface. 
um, that can, uh, allows you to store and retrieve any amount of data from anywhere on the web. With S3, you only pay for the storage that you actually use, and so there's no planning associated with any uh, spikes in usage or storage growth. So S3 is designed uh, really for applications to access the data directly, not through an operating system or a file system. And that makes it uniquely suited for big data applications. So unlike things like HDFS, there's no need to run a compute cluster just for the storage. If you have multiple consumers of the same data sets, things like Spark or Hive or Presto, that's a perfect use case for S3 because they can all access the same shared data sets securely. And one of the biggest advantages of S3 in a big data environment is you can store literally any amount of data at very high bandwidth with really no aggregate throughput limits. So like S3, I imagine that RDS requires no introduction at this point as well. So as a quick reminder, RDS will make it easy to set up, operate, and scale a relational database in the cloud. So it provides very cost efficient and resizable capacity. And it frees you up from some of the database administration, administrator to, uh, tasks like, um, so it frees you up to focus on your applications and your data and your business. RDS supports a variety of different engines, uh, all the way from open source options to commercial ones. In today's talk, we will be focusing on RDS Postgres because that is the engine that's being used in the learning analytics platform. But with all the different engines, the value proposition is similar. So with RDS, you can deploy scalable Postgres in minutes um, with cost efficient and resizable hardware capacity. Uh, RDS will manage the complex and time consuming tasks like um, the Postgres software install or upgrades or storage management, or replication for high availability or backups. RDS Postgres can scale from five gigabytes to six terabytes, and from 1,000 IOPS to 30,000. It also supports read replicas in both local and remote regions. The last service that I'll cover is DynamoDB. Uh, DynamoDB is a fast and flexible NoSQL database. Um, it's designed for any type of application, including tier one applications that require very consistent single digit latency, sorry, single digit millisecond latency at virtually any scale. It's a fully managed service, which means there's no administration and zero infrastructure for you to, to manage. Um, DynamoDB supports both a document and a key value model store, uh, sorry, key value store model. And durability is achieved by automatically replicating data across three different facilities. Um, Dynamo is often a natural choice for uh, big data application architectures. And the reasons are that the NoSQL nature and the durability and availability that is provided as part of the service are extremely supportive of very large data sets from multiple sources. When you create a table, you need to specify how much uh, request capacity you need. Um, and so if that ever changes, you can always change the read or the write capacity that you need by making an API call or through the console. We have customers that run over a million requests per second on a single table and more than 100 terabytes of worth of data so the takeaway is that um, you're no longer preoccupied with horizontally scaling a NoSQL database. Um, you will simply continue to write to DynamoDB. And with that, I'll hand it back to Terry. Thank you, Benjamin. So let's take a look at the four elements of the architecture, input, output, and reconcile API, and then the stream processing layer. This is the input API. As mentioned previously, it's really the front door for our system. It, it's implemented using a simple REST endpoint to receive one or more up to 300 caliper events in a single request. These events then are validated against an optional user-supplied schema, and if it's successful, then the record is published to Amazon Kinesis Stream. A primary rec audit record is written, and finally a receipt is generated and returned back to the event producer. Let's walk through some of the steps of this microservice. 
And note that a similar pattern is used for the output, reconcile API, and stream processing layer. Step one, this is the event producer. This is the element that actually generates the caliper events, and in the future will be generating the domain events. And then the input API. So the event producer generates thousands of caliper events per second destined for the input API. And then we receive these events through the public endpoint. The event producer is signed a set of AWS credentials, and we use these values to apply SIGV4 against the request. Step two, the API gateway authentication and producer credential enables SIGV4 processing in the API gateway by setting the authorization type equal to AWS IAM. From that point, all calls made against the endpoint are required to supply a valid authorization header in the request. Step three is Lambda invocation. The API gateway service then executes the input Lambda function when an inbound request is processed. Step four, the authorized user metadata. When an authenticated user invokes a Lambda function, there's metadata about this particular request. So for example, there may be source property that is not carried within the body of the message itself. And we store this information in a separate MHE system. Step five is a schema validation where the architecture validates the caliper event against the schema. And then step six is about the uh, Kinesis publishing. The caliper event is then published to the Amazon Kinesis stream. The service requires that we set explicit permissions um, which will ex execute then the put object request. The present presence of this record in Kinesis means that the input API has accepted the event and successfully written it to Kinesis for further processing. Step seven, CloudWatch metrics and logging. Each service publishes metrics and output logging to CloudWatch. Step eight is about continuous integration. We use Jenkins as a simple continuous integration service for building and deploying our code. Step nine is about DevOps access, which is really providing access uh, to the set of microservices that we have, as well as any of the Amazon services that are used. The output API is basically the service that's responsible, again, for enabling data consumers to query the data in a variety of ways. So the query results that are used in the visualizations or the reports. It has to be lightweight enough so there has to be just enough infrastructure around it so that the query process is able to give the users full control over the queries that they have written. So each endpoint actually takes the form of a caliper event type and a caliper action value. In this way, it's possible to query all different caliper events using a very simple URL structure. So from step one, the event consumer or user of the application interested in extracting the information stored in Elasticsearch. We receive these query requests through the public endpoint. Then step three is the invocation of the output Lambda. And then step six is the output API Lambda that reads the data stores, including an Elasticsearch cluster, DynamoDB, S3, and Postgres RDS. The Reconcile API, and this is actually super critical for us. This is where we maintain the audit uh, of our, all the events that go throughout our system, and it's basically stored in an Elasticsearch cluster. Um, what's really critical for us is to be able to identify any sort of processing failures that may be occur, uh, to look, locate also to this archived event in the, um, if we have to play it back and also to, to store um, uh, as a record for uh, any sort of additional audit trail information we may have to provide to a school. For stream processing, um, this is really the secret sauce. So this is the consumer of the events from Kinesis and the output of events to some sort of a storage mechanism. The services perform the filtering and transformation of the messages, and this is also to where I've mentioned we pr um, perform uh, uh, we run various algorithms against it. So we may have like an adaptive tutoring system, gaming, or some additional homework support system. We run the algorithms then in the processing lambda. So I want to go over some of the architecture trade-offs that we made while building the lab system. 
Um, we looked at Amazon API Gateway, and we actually, we, we did compare it to writing all the code that we would have needed um, uh, to receive HTTP requests, authenticate it, process it, um, start to think about what it would take to auto-scale the instances based on CPU utilization, and came to the rapid conclusion that was just crazy. Um, so we decided to go ahead and move forward with the input API. The Pro, it really is highly integrated. Um, it's integrated with all the other downstream services that we use. It automatically scales for us. Um, it handles the thousands of concurrent calls that we need, and also to provides all the other elements, traffic management, authorization, and access control. Uh, the con that we encounter was that it does not support gzip compression, so if you think that where we may have a uh, event uh, request with many different events in it with over 300 events in it, potentially um, scaling up to 500 events, um, you know, those messages actually get quite large, and so without uh, gzip compression, um, it's a little bit problematic for us. Um, one workaround is to set up CloudFront um, and to enable compression through that. Another architecture trade-off is with Lambda. So we looked at what it would take to actually build out all the EC2 instances, and then uh, compared that with AWS Lambda. And what we really liked about it was that Lambda is a low-cost approach. Uh, we wouldn't have to provision the thousands and thousands of EC2 instances for this type of architecture. Also, too, we only pay for the compute time. Um, so there really isn't any charge when the code is not running. And this is, again, super critical for us to maintain that low price point. So um, the other thing is that we really run the code without it, uh, with zero administration, no servers, no instances. So we don't have to turn around to our DevOps team and say, hey, guess what? We need a bunch of EC2 instances. Um, so it really, it's been great for the developers. It continuously scales. It, ha it automatically scales based on the needs of our application, particularly, too, when we have the great volume of students who hop on the system, let's say, Monday morning to submit their homework assignments. Um, also, too, uh, we really like um, that it, it's easier for the developers to set it up and to use Lambda. So we selected Lambda. Um, the con, though, that, you know, and we planned for it, though I don't think we plan enough time, we, have, we had very limited experience with Lambda, um, so there is a little bit of a learning curve. We also, too, are limited to CloudWatch um, for monitoring. And the Lambda can only handle about six megabytes of data in the request or response body. Um, and so we've had issues with performance testing with large data sets. And then lastly, uh, debugging is time consuming as there really aren't any good debug tools. So you have to go through the various logs. Um, Amazon Kinesis Streams, we compared this to setting up Kafka and Zookeeper. We, ha we have actually a lot of experience with Kafka and Zookeeper. We know we needed a streaming mechanism for processing the high volumes that we would receive. Again, the 10,000 events per second. And we had, we had to think of how we were going to scale this to grow to eventually 15 million events. We've got a lot of experience, again, that I mentioned, and, but we thought, wow, we're going to have to be able to predict the storage and volume needs. So um, we also, too, we had a, a very serious issue that occurred over the summertime where um, I call it that Kafka lost its brains. Um, we lost all the configuration files, and so it took us a couple of hours to restore those. Um, so Kinesis, it's a managed service. It, it has built-in cross-availability zone, uh, replication, and failover. Um, and if we'd gone with Kafka, we'd actually have to have had set this up. And so again, Kinesis has all the integrations and all the other downstream services that we need. So Kinesis for us acts as a type of queue. It allows us to smooth out the sudden bursts of data that we receive. Um, it's also to, to recognize some of the resiliency functions that you have that are built in there. Now, um, this is sort of more a, a, an oddity, if you will, uh, that applies to our use case. It, it may apply to some other uh, use cases, but um, one thing we encountered was that um, 
Kinesis may lose records if you don't have the Kinesis setting set correctly. Um, we sort of discovered this a little bit after the fact. Um, so uh, what happens is that you have a shard in the Kinesis stream um, that is processed by an, an instance uh, of the lambda function, which consumes the batches of records from the shard. And if the lambda function processing, um, if, if the shard throws an error, it'll be invoked again with that very same batch of information of records. So if the errors continue, though, it, um, there is an automatic back off and retry, but it will block processing until the um, batch is processed successfully. So what we encountered was really a data backup in Kinesis, and so um, we had to adjust this up to seven days, and it's working quite well for us now. Uh, for S3, you know, again, this is really kind of a no-brainer decision. I mean, we just compared it to Rackspace and to OpenStack Swift. Um, but really, it's uh, very secure. It's a managed service, very easy to use and expensive. The only sort of con that we encountered was uh, you do receive SSL mismatch errors if you want to use your own domain name. Uh, uh, in terms of Elasticsearch, we compared this with setting up our own Lucene and Elasticsearch instances. Um, but again, Elasticsearch was really integrated with all the other services that we needed, as well as some other services that we're contemplating for the future. And so Elasticsearch has become really our data lake for all learning events that we receive. And um, we basically, uh, we use it then, and, uh, we have systems in place that um, monitor the index on Elasticsearch and automatically roll over indices when they exceed certain thresholds. The con which applies um, to our use case, again, is that the Amazon version is typically about a release behind the Elasticsearch company. Um, it may not be critical to others. It's not really critical to us, frankly. Um, for Amazon Dynamo uh, DB, we compared this again with MongoDB, but we had really serious performance issues even after we had tuned it fairly significantly. We encountered data loss. Um, with Dynamo DB, we actually had a lot of teams who had experience with Dynamo. It's very low cost, it's fast and flexible, no SQL data store, it is fully managed. Uh, we use Dynamo DB to maintain metadata about the events, to manage our user preferences, and to uh, provide what's called an uh, OAuth data API. Um, we have service endpoints that are uh, called by an application. We need to ensure that that launch is not reused. The con um, you need to be aware of is um, some of the limitations on the row size and that it's uh, limited to one megabyte query. Um, However, if you use the last evaluated key for the query response, you can retrieve more results. Um, for an item size, DynamoDB allocates resources for your table according to the number of reads or writes and the cap uh, write capacity units that you've specified. Um, this is really super important here because I'm going to talk about an issue that we encountered. Um, so. Uh, if your examples, uh, I'm sorry, if your uh, items are greater than for kilobytes, um, and you may need some additional capacity units. So um, the last architecture trade-off that we looked at was Postgres uh, SQL. There are actually three different um, sort of facets to this that we compared. The first was, you know, can it handle, handle the number of concurrent um, uh, connections? Second was, can it actually compile and we'll, we'll be able to use some advanced analytical queries against it. And then third was, does it actually, will it be able to actually scale the storage to meet our needs? So definitely check, it scales to the six terabytes, so it's, def it's within our immediate need. It supports um, the concurrent connections that we needed, and it has that full analytical engine capability. And this is a, a con, it's something that it's not really, um, uh, immediate to us, but something we're thinking about for the future. We know that our data volumes are going to grow considerably in the future. So we, we've thought about some of the archiving and other strategies to reduce the volume that we have. Eventually, we may need to um, switch this out for Redshift. 
Also, too, internally, um, we're using Aurora for many of our systems, including one called Ingrade Pro. In terms of estimated cost savings, uh, and talked about this a little bit um, earlier, uh, overall, we estimated it was about 430K to handle the 1 billion events. Um, but with this new architecture, it's about 130K to handle the 1 billion events. And obviously, we want to drive those costs down further. Um, and as you can see, really, Lambda, using Lambda has been the biggest cost saver in this overall architecture. We also, too, we didn't include an estimate of the additional cost savings, um, such as you, really we require fewer DevOps resources for the build and operations of this new architecture. And we estimated it would actually take about seven DevOps resources if we had gone forward with, that, uh, with the many EC2 instances that we have. We've also, too, experienced gains in agili agility. Um, the developers are able to very quickly um, code something, invoke it from Lambda, and see what it does. These are two graphics. The first graphic depicts really our sort of our monthly growth trends of what we've seen for Connect sites. And as you can see, we have the uh, uh, peak between January and May, and then between um, September and December, and then the lull in between. So we want to basically scale our systems up and scale them down. Last graphic on the bottom is the hours by which reports are accessed, and you can see clearly that students and instructors are night owls. So some of the challenges um, that we've encountered and how we've worked through them, I mentioned earlier that we lost events. We are looking at some of the re-architecture for the processing and aggregation um, layer not to depend as much on Elasticsearch. What we encountered was that um, we used Elasticsearch incorrectly. We used it for sort of acid properties. It does not maintain a mutable state. Um, so it lost basically rights when you concurrently try to create documents within it. Um, so this has been really the root cause of our aggregation processing. So we realized that we're probably gonna have to perform some additional pre-aggregations up front. Elasticsearch performance. Um, We've encountered uh, basically um, some issues with report queries, uh, particularly for another product that we have called Reading Wonders. It's not meeting um, the service level agreements that we establish with the business. And so uh, we've enabled doc value optimization elastic search. That certainly um, we've tuned the performance up there. But also, too, we're going to probably have to move some of the processing out of elastic search into the application tier. We also, too, may um, have to increase the number of database nodes to get that last bit of performance. And let's see, um, be aware, too, of the elastic search limits. Um, I spoke a little about these. Um, some of the elastic search limits are um, that it handles 32 terabytes, and so obviously um, you may need to think about some additional mechanisms for handling the data there. And, um, you know, as I speculate about the Kinesis stream retention, that's very particular to our use case, and we had to adjust that from 24 hours to seven days. And then uh, we encountered this really kind of weird problem with DynamoDB. Um, over time, we had a right throttling error. We applied a Band-Aid by increasing the right provision level of the global index. Um, it worked for a while until the table of size exceeded the AWS defined boundaries. And so what happened was that there basically there was repartitioning of the table. And this lowered the per node write capacity. So again, we had to increase the provisioning level. And at some point, we were over 10,000 units per second. And we were still uncamming the throttle error. It was like, oh my gosh, what the heck have we done? Um, so we contacted our uh, enterprise support team, and they sent us this heat map. Guess what? We were only using two of the key spaces, um, two, two of the 100 key spaces for the partition. So they really helped us diagnose the problem and determine what was happening. Um, we had to redesign the table basically so that our rights were evenly spaced out across partitions. So how do we build confidence? You know, we've lost events, we've had problems with DynamoDB, it's like, wow, we, didn't, we weren't meeting the SLA of the business. 
we went through extensive testing. So we built confidence through um, every possible imaginable test, uh, performance, failover, functional, and business acceptance testing. You can see two images here, um, basically the top images of the input, where we demonstrate we can scale and handle the 10,000 events per second, um, really no errors. And then the output, uh, we were able to receive events as fast as we were pushing them through the platform. So Caliper Event Center sent to the input API and we validate the, the persistence to Elasticsearch and S3. That's really the essence of the test. The tools that we use for testing, HP Load Runner and Sosta, Sosta Cloud Test, cloud tests um, for the Reconcile API, and again, this is really critical for us. Um, we can't lose events. Um, so we basically use the Reconcile API um, to demonstrate and to confirm that we've successfully processed events after the fact, or even if we have to replay events. And in terms of monitoring of the components, we monitor the input, uh, Kinesis streams, S3, and Elasticsearch clusters and Lambda functions and query API. Um, uh, and all this was, at the end of the day, we were able to meet our service level agreements. The 10,000 events per second output of 300 events for the queries uh, to feed the reports and visualizations and to support batches of 300 events. So some of the lessons learned. We use the serverless architecture framework for managing the API gateway and Lambda configurations and code deployments, uh, greatly streamlining, streamlining our overall development and deployments. Uh, we've relied heavily on CloudWatch for monitoring all services and Sumo Logic for close to real-time log searches and analysis. In the future, we may look at replacing this with Elk. Teams developed automated tests, um, and this is too, I think, one thing that has enabled us to be successful. So uh, develop your end-to-end -end test early across all your various integration points. We have also, too, developed custom dashboard mixing business metrics with CloudWatch data and Kinesis Lambda and Elasticsearch. And we actually provide some of these custom access to these custom dashboards to our customers so that they can see what's going on. For Amazon API Gateway, we experienced some SIG v4 issues. For now, we're manually managing the IAM keys. Uh, for Lambda, um, this was actually another hard lesson, particularly when you have a great number of students who are hopping on the system at 8 a.m. in the morning, uh, cold start. So you may need to use a warmer, um, which basically you, you pump a whole bunch of performance data through the system and then you flush it out. We've also, too, um, we've had great integrations with Kinesis S3 and other services for this event-based triggering. That was actually you know, the, the least painful part of it. We were anticipating that, that we would have the most problem here, and we didn't. Um, one thing to be aware of is that uh, uh, it's very sensitive. Lambda is very sensitive to EC2's auto-scaling outages. And we've experienced a couple of outages um, and slowness. Also, too, you need some better debug tools to understand what's going on inside of Lambda. So distributed tracing and debug support. For Kinesis, um, it scales uh, up and down uh, the number of shards, but this is a bit of a challenge, and we've used some third-party tools for this. Um, so you really need to go ahead and provision. It's safer to provision up front for your expected peak. This is so that you don't get slammed when you've got the 14 million students who hop on the system at 8 a.m. in the morning. Um, it's much more involved to delete and recreate Lambda um, Kinesis event sources, and so we'd like the ability to be able to um, purge. Like, for example, if we receive poison pill messages, we want to be able to quickly uh, purge. This is a functionality that exists within SQS. For uh, Elasticsearch service, um, we've developed scripts to automate the creation of indices, aliases, and mappings. And that's saved us quite a bit of time, too, if we have to do any sort of restoration. In terms of queue capacity limits, um, this has to do with the number of Kinesis shards to handle data throughput. Um, 25 concurrent lambdas cannot ex execute large bulk index requests without exceeding um, the 
Elasticsearch queue capacity limits. Um, unfortunately, any sort of configuration change requires a full cluster rebuild and data migration, which can take about a half an hour to an hour, and we can't, we can't have downtime in our system. It's extremely disruptive. Um, also, too, in terms of uh, we need some performance tuning and monitoring. Um, it's a bit more difficult with Elasticsearch. If we'd use the uh, company version, they have some additional tools that are available there, so we'd like some, um, some more tools, if you will, for performance tuning. And then, uh, lastly, AWS Enterprise Support. Um, they're wonderful. Reach out to them if you have issues. They've saved us countless hours. Um, trying to determine the root cause. They provided us many insights, really some key engineering talent that we just don't have within our own shop. So in terms of takeaways, know about what your own state requires in terms of production scale. Um, we, we had to build a system that handles the two to 14 million concurrent students uh, to handle the 10K events, and in the future, we want to be able to scale, scale that up to 15 million events. Also, to think about your service level agreements for the business. Um, so for us, we had to make sure that we met that 10,000 events per second, be able to produce 300 um, yeah, queries for the output, and then to be able to handle batches of 300 events. Think about the overall estimated cost, um, including DevOps, engineers, architects, and some of the cost savers. And for us, Lambda saved us quite a bit of cost, as well as with the other services that we use, because they were already integrated. Take the time. Um, our architecture took you know, about two years to really get the right integrations, uh, to get everything working well, the multiple iterations. Um, and lastly, enterprise support well worth the cost, and they provided us a lot of information. All right. Um, thank you very much, Terry. Um, I wanted to kind of wrap things up very quickly from, from my perspective as well um, and kind of think about what, what this means and what we can learn from this. And as a solutions architect, I'm constantly learning from, from my customers. And I think one of the things that are becoming very evident in the last one or two years is that we're seeing sort of this new breed of applications and platforms that are running on AWS, things like the learning analytics platform. And this new breed is um, really embracing the, this serverless approach and, and decoupling every element of their architecture. And these are things that development teams have been asking to do for years. But now with services like Lambda, like API Gateway, like Kinesis, like these fully managed data stores, it's become possible to take this to the next logical step. And from a business perspective, what we're seeing is that companies like McGraw-Hill are doing this for their applications that are mission critical, that are well within the critical path of their revenue generating products. And what we're hearing from them is that they're doing this because it drives down costs significantly but also they're now able to consume significantly larger data sets, and that makes their products richer. And that's even before we begin to mention the, the huge benefits of the significantly less management that's needed, the less upkeep that's needed with architectures like this compared to traditional architectures. So hopefully this has been educational and helpful for you to kind of leave here with thoughts about how you can um, architect new workloads on AWS and perhaps uh, re-architect or refactor existing workloads in an iterative fashion. Uh, I'd like to thank Terry very, very much uh, for, for joining us today and walking us through that. I'd like to thank you as well for, for joining us. Um, thank you very much, and please thank fill you. out your feedback forms. Thank you.